let's go ahead and start. Um, did anybody have any questions before I begin? All right, so um, if you guys remember, last time we started looking at acid-base titrations and we said the reason we're looking at acid-base titrations in class is because it allows us to apply all of the principles of acid-base chemistry that we've looked at previously, okay? And so if we can do these calculations, it illustrates that, you know, we have a good grasp of all the underlying principles that we've been studying up to this point, okay? And we said when you look at acid-base titrations, there are three types of acid-base titrations. You have strong acid, strong base, or strong acid, sorry, uh, weak acid, strong base, or weak base, strong acid, okay? And last time we took the first of this, that was looking at strong acid versus strong base. And if you guys remember, the example that we took was that we put the strong base in the burette. We had 0.1 molar of the strong base in the burette and we put 100 milliliters of the strong acid in the flask. And I said, as I said last time, usually if you're carrying this out in the laboratory, your goal is to figure out the concentration of the acid in the flask because remember you always put the solution with the unknown concentration in the flask. But because this is more of um, a mental challenge, what we want to do is we know the concentrations in the flask as well. Now we're going to calculate the, what the pH would be. Usually you measure the pH using the pH meter. Here what we're going to do is we're going to give you the concentration and volume in the flask as well and let's see whether we could calculate the pH that you would measure if you put a pH meter in there, okay? And we took three scenarios. We, we calculated the pH of the strong acid before you added any base. Then we looked at a case where now we added 30 milliliters of the base. And so the second scenario was calculating the pH after 30 milliliters of the base had been added. And we said that once 30 milliliters of base had been added to the flask, now we had 130 milliliters. So the total volume in the flask after adding the 30 milliliters would be 130 milliliters. And then the last scenario that we looked at was what happens after you've passed the equivalence point. And so now we looked at a case where we had added 100.5 milliliters of um, base. And so the total volume would be 200.05 milliliters. Now last time when I wrote this down, the third scenario, I wrote down the total volume rather than give you the amount of base that had been added. So if you can, you know, turn back to your notes and make sure that you write down that the amount of base added was 100.05 milliliters, okay? Because what I wrote down last time um, when we worked the problem was I gave you the total volume, but I did not give you the amount of base that was added. So once you add 100.05 milliliters of base, to the 100 milliliters of acid in the flask, your total volume is 200.05, okay? So can you make that change in your notes and make sure you note down that we added 100.05 milliliters of the base and the number that I gave you in that problem is the total volume, okay? And some of you were confused by that, so I want to clarify that. Now today, we're going to move on to looking at the second class and these are the ones where now we're going to look at where we have a weak acid where it says strong base. So we're going to look at a titration where you have a strong base and let's say we have the same base which is 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide but now in the flask, instead of having HCl, we're going to have a weak acid. And the weak acid we're going to look at is 100 milliliters of 0.1 molar. Let's say we're looking at acetic acid. And this is a weak acid because we know Ka equals 1.76 times 10 to the negative 5. Okay, so now we're going to do the same calculations that we did before 
but we're going to look at a weak acid, okay? So before we start doing anything, we need to know what kind of reactions are taking place. Remember we said an acid and a base in large amounts cannot coexist. They're going to give you water, all right? So now what we have is instead of having a strong acid we know that dissociates completely, we have a weak acid. What do we know about the weak acid? It does not dissociate completely. In fact, only about 0.1% dissociate. So the major part of the weak acid, almost 99.9% .9 remains undissociated. So the major species in the weak acid will be the undissociated acid. So if we were to write down the, the complete ionic equation for the reaction that takes place, we know that in the flask, we have a weak acid and now the weak acid remains undissociated. 99.9% .9 of the weak acid remains in this form. Only about 0.01% actually dissociates to give you the conjugate base and the hydronium ion, okay? So the major species would be the weak acid. But now we're adding a strong base to this. So if I add a strong base, that dissociates completely. So the, the instant I add sodium hydroxide, I know sodium hydroxide is a strong base. It dissociates completely to give me that. So this is what I would have at the beginning before any reaction takes place. At time zero, the instant you add the base to the acid at time zero, these are the species that will be there in solution. You're going to have the undissociated weak acid and the dissociated strong base. Now, we know that an acid and a base cannot coexist. So we have a weak acid and we have a strong base and we have substantial amounts of both. So the weak acid and the strong base cannot coexist. They're going to give you water. What's going to happen? This hydroxide strong base will pull off this hydrogen atom here so that you end up with the conjugate base, water, and Na plus, all right? So remember, if you have a weak acid, we said acids and bases in substantial amounts cannot coexist. They're going to react to neutralize each other to give you water. So you have a large amount of weak acid and you have a large amount of hydroxide, so the hydroxide will react with the weak acid to give you water and its conjugate base. Now in this case, if you look at the spectator ions, you can see that there's only one spectator ion. This is the spectator ion and that's the spectator ion. So you can see that Na plus is the spectator ion. In the previous example, we had two spectator ions. We had chloride ions and sodium ions as spectators, but here we have only one spectator ion, which is the sodium. And we said if you take the spectator ions out, because remember, they're there at the beginning, they're there at the end, they're not really involved in the reaction. So if you take the spectator ions out, what you end up with is the net ionic equation. And the net ionic equation summarizes exactly what's going on. So you have a weak acid, it's going to react with a strong base, and we know both of these can't coexist. They're going to neutralize each other to give you water. And so what we end up with is the conjugate base plus water. So simply put, if you want to summarize the process or the reaction that actually takes place when you add a strong base to a weak acid, the net ionic equation summarizes it. All right, the weak acid reacts to a strong base to give you conjugate base and water. Now this reaction, remember in titrations, the reactions have to be clean, quantitative and rapid. And so this is a reaction that takes place completely, it takes place cleanly, and it takes place complete, uh, quantitative. That means the, if you're looking at um, a limiting reactant, an excess reactant and so on, this reaction will take place completely and what you end up with is the excess reactant left over, okay? Now usually, up to this point, you would have seen the general reaction, all right? And the general reaction is quite misleading. So if you look at the general reaction, 
you have to kind of read between the lines. If you look at the general reaction, uh, reactant is the weak acid, uh, base is the strong base sodium hydroxide giving you the salt, which is this, plus water. All right? But what the general reaction doesn't show you is that the strong base actually dissociates completely. The strong base doesn't stay as an AOH. We know that once the products are formed, you end up with water and salt. So usually acid-base reactions result in the formation of water and a salt. The salt that you form is the sodium salt of the acetate anion, but because it's a soluble salt, you know that it dissociates completely. So even though you write it like that, we know that it has dissociated completely. All right? So this, these, this is what the reactions look like, and overall the net ionic equation is what summarizes exactly what's going on in that solution, okay? So now we want to do the same thing. We're going to calculate the pH when you add certain amounts of sodium hydroxide to it, okay? But before that, I want to show you what the titration curve looks like. Now, to to compare the two, we'll start by looking at the strong acid, okay? So let me just make this smaller. So this is the strong acid versus strong base. This is what we've seen before for hydrochloric acid and NaOH. If, and we said that has an S-shaped curve and that's shown here, okay? Now if instead of having the acid in the flask, if I have the base in the flask and I'm adding the strong acid, you can see now that the curve is, is the mirror image of this, all right? So here, to begin with, before you add any of the titrant, the pH is one. If instead, in the flask, if you have a strong base, you can see now before any titrant is added, all you have is 0.1 molar NaOH. 0.1 molar NaOH will have a pH of 13 because hydroxide ion is 10 to the negative 1, therefore hydronium ion would be 10 to the negative 13, and if that will give you a pH of 13. You see that? So if you just look at the pH before you add any of the titrant, you know whether you have a strong acid or strong base in the flask, and you can see that this curve is actually a mirror image of that, all right? And so the whole process is now reversed. Now we're going to move on to looking at a weak acid then now that titration curve looks like this. So what you have here is this is the pH and over here the volume of base added. And remember we said the shape of this curve, if it's a strong acid, strong base, is an S-shaped curve or sigmoidal. So you see that for a strong acid, you see that it is S-shaped. But if you have a weak acid, you actually have two S's. See, there's one S here and the second S here. So if you have a curve that has two S in there, that means that now you're looking at a weak acid versus a strong base, all right? So that's the difference between the plot for a strong acid versus a weak acid. In fact, it depends on, this curvature depends on the Ka of the weak acid. So here I have a picture that kind of shows you what this looks like. So way down here, this represents the strong acid. That's the typical S-shaped curve. Now this is another strong acid over here. But now you can see as the acids get weaker and weaker and weaker, you can see that that curve here becomes more pronounced, all right? And so the end result is that what I want you to remember is that if you take a weak acid like acidic acid and sodium hydroxide, this is what that curve looks like, okay? Not very good. <coughs> And if you want to see a picture of what this plot looks like, if you were to collect the data in the laboratory, this is what it looks like. So here what we have is once again um, a curve, and these are actual data points that were collected. So you can see that as you add aliquots of sodium 
hydroxide. The dots represent the actual titration. And you can see that there is a first curve here and then a, one like that, okay? If it were like this, that would be a strong acid, strong base. So this is a titration curve that corresponds to a weak acid versus a strong base. Now, if you look at the equivalence point, so this is the equivalence point. And remember, one of the things that we said was if you take a strong acid, strong base, at the equivalence point, the solution will be neutral because all the strong acid has been neutralized by all the strong base. And all you have in, in that solution is salt and water. The salt is sodium chloride, the pH is neutral. Water, the pH is neutral. Therefore, all you have in there is neutral solutions. And therefore, the way to tell where the equivalence point is, you look for pH 7, and that will tell you the equivalence point. Now, in this instance, the equivalence point will always be greater than 7. The solution is going to be basic. And the reason is that if you look at the net ionic equation, so here we are. If you look at this net ionic equation, you know that the weak acid reacts with hydroxide to give you acetate ion. So can you see that here what we have is the conjugate base of a weak acid. At the equivalence point, you have water, which is neutral, and you have the conjugate base of a weak acid. The conjugate base of a weak acid, is it acidic, basic, or neutral? It's going to be basic. And therefore, the pH has to be greater than 7. Do you see that? So for weak acid, strong base titrations, at the equivalence point, the pH will be basic. It has to be above 7. And you can see in this plot, it's around 8. OK? So this would be the equivalence point right here, which is above 8. All right? Now, in this region, you can see that it's almost flat. Can everybody see that that plot, the pH hardly changes in this region? All right? And the reason that the pH hardly changes in this region is because as you add strong base to acidic acid, what you're forming is acetate anion. So in this region, what we have is a weak acid and its conjugate base. Whenever you have a mixture of a weak acid and its conjugate base in substantial amounts, in approximately equal amounts, what does it act like? A buffer. So can everybody see that in that region, it's acting like a buffer because you have both the weak acid and you have the weak base. And because both of them are coexisting, that region is going to act like a buffer. And if it acts like a buffer, you can see that the pH hardly changes. And so that's why we see this flat region here. This is a flat region where the pH hardly changes. All right? And um, here is another example of that flat region where the pH hardly changes. OK? So what we're going to be doing is now we're going to do the same calculations that we did with strong acids and strong bases. Now we're going to look at it in terms of weak acid, strong base. OK? And so we're going to go on the presumption that we have 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide in there. We're going to now have 100 milliliters of 0.1 molar acidic acid in the flask. So let's start calculating this. So once again, we have to go through the whole process, OK? So we start by looking at the first scenario where we calculate the pH before any base is added. All right? Before any base is added, what we have is 0.1 molar acidic acid, and we know that the Ka for the acid is 1.76 times 10 to the negative 5. OK? Now, all of you know how to calculate the pH of a weak acid. How do we do that? All right? Remember, that's the first kind of problems that we work. We have acidic acid. You can set up the equilibrium. So what we have is we have acidic acid equals in water giving me um, the con so this is the acid, this is the base, 
This is the proton donor. This is the proton acceptor. So what you end up with is the conjugate base and hydronium ion. All of you remember that. Okay, and we know Ka is 1.76 times 10 to the negative 5. We say at the beginning, the concentration of acidic acid is 0.1 molar. We're not interested in water, 0, 0. Uh, the change would be minus x, not just in water, plus x, plus x. At equilibrium, we know this would be 0.1 minus x. We know this would be x. We know that Ka equals 1.76 times 10 to the negative 5, which equals the concentration of the acetate ions times the concentration of the hydronium ion divided by the concentration of acidic acid which is x squared over 0.1 minus x. We can approximate that to x squared divided by 0.1. You guys know the process. So if you solve for this, okay, and validate your approximation and so on, I'm not going to go through the whole process because we've worked problems like this so many times and you know how to calculate the pH of a weak acid. But we know if you calculate x, X gives us the hydronium ion concentration, which turns out to be um, 1.33 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. And therefore, if you calculate the pH of that solution, it comes out to be 2.877. So I want you to try this at home and make sure you, you know, you know the process. Okay, so all we have is a weak acid in the flask and we know how to calculate the pH of a weak acid once you know the concentration. So that's the pH before we add any base. Now we're going to go on to the second scenario where we look at um, what happens when we add 30 milliliters. Okay, so the second scenario is we're going to calculate pH after 30 milliliters of NaOH is added. Now we said in these titrations because the volume is constantly changing because we're calculating the pH in the flask and because we're incrementally adding sodium hydroxide and because the volume is changing, in other words you're diluting that solution, we need to uh, um, we can't think of everything in concentration because concentration is moles divided by the volume and if the volume keeps changing, that means the concentration is changing. And therefore, in these calculations, we always calculate the number of moles because the number of moles of the acid uh, does not change. As, you, as the reaction takes place, you can figure out the number of moles of the acid that's consumed and then we can figure out the number of moles that's left over. And if we can figure the number of moles, then we can calculate the new concentration. Okay? So we're going to use the same strategy that we used last time. So we're going to start by calculating the initial number of moles of acidic acid. So we want to know how many moles of the acid are actually in the flask before any reaction takes place. And that is 0 0.100 moles per liter times we had 100 milliliters, which is 0 0.100 liters. Okay, we're taking everything in three significant figures. So that comes out to 1 times 10 to the negative 2 moles of acidic acid. So before any reaction took place, this is the number of moles of acidic acid that you had. Okay? Likewise, we're going to calculate the initial number of moles of hydroxide ion that we added. So this is the, the number of moles of hydroxide that's in the 30 milliliters that you determined. Now how do I convert concentration to moles? So remember we added 30 milliliters of NaOH to the flask. So if I want to calculate the number of moles of hydroxide in the 30 milliliters, what do I need to know? How do I calculate moles if I, get, if I have the concentration? times the volume, okay? So I'm going to take concentration times volume. So I have 0.1 moles per liter of sodium hydroxide times I added 30 milliliters, so that becomes 
uh, it goes to three significant figures, so it becomes 0 0.03 liters, and that gives me three times 10 to the negative three moles of hydroxide. So what I've calculated is the number of moles of each of the reactants before any reaction took place. Now I need to figure out after this reaction is completed, how much of uh, each component do I have. So in order to do this, I need to write the net ionic equation. What was the net ionic equation for this? We know that it's a weak acid, so we start with the weak acid. So we have acidic acid, which is the weak acid, okay? The other reactant was hydroxide ion. It reacts cleanly, rapidly, and quantitatively to give me the conjugate base, which is the acetate anion plus water, okay? So we're going to start by saying before any reaction takes place, what I have is I just calculated that I have 1 times 10 to the negative 2 moles of acidic acid and that I have 3 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of hydroxide and I have none of that. Okay, I'm not concerned about water because water is the solvent, okay? So now we're going to let the reaction take place. So what we have is after reaction occurs. Now this is a limiting reactant problem. You can see that this is excess, this is limiting, all right? So that means that if I subtract this from this, what I end up with is 7 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. All of this is consumed and the reason it's consumed is because this is the limiting reactant and this is the excess reactant, okay? So if all of this reacts, you can see on the product side, I end up with 3 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. All right, so once this reaction has taken place, we know that we have some unreacted acidic acid left over and we form the conjugate base. So now what do I have there? If I have a weak acid in its conjugate base, how is that system going to act? If you have a weak acid and its conjugate base together in approximately equal amounts, what do we know? It's going to act as a buffer. If it's a buffer, how do you calculate the pH of a buffer? You can use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. All right, so now I know the moles of the acidic acid. I know the moles of its conjugate base. If I'm going to apply the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, I need to know concentration. All right, so how do I convert moles to concentration? Divide by the volume. What is my volume? 100 milliliters, I added 30. So now my total volume is what? 130, okay? So now I'm going to go calculate the new concentration. So I'm going to start by calculating the concentration of the excess reactant that's left over, which is the moles divided by the new volume, which is 130 liters, or 0.13 liters or 130 milliliters and that comes out to be 5.38 times 10 to the negative 3, uh, 10 to the negative 2 molar and then I'm going to calculate its conjugate base which is 3 times 10 to the negative 3 moles divided by 0.13 liters which gives me uh, 2.31 times 10 to the negative 2 molar Okay, so now I know the concentration of the weak acid and its conjugate base. Now I can say pH equals pKa minus log the concentration of the acid form divided by the concentration of the acetate anion after the titration is completed. So we're going to assume that that's our new initial. And so this is acidic acid, so this is 4.754 minus log. 
Concentration of the acid is 5.38 times 10 to the negative 2 divided by the concentration of the acetate which is 2.31 times 10 to the negative 2. And so that gives me a pH of 4.387. Okay, so now we've calculated what the pH of that solution is in that flask. Can everybody see that what we're doing is the same stuff that we've done before except that now we have a lot more things going on. And I want you to be able to understand this at the same level, all right? There's a lot of detail there and you need to kind of understand that in this instance what's happening is there's a reaction taking place. After that reaction is complete, we want to calculate what are the species in that solution in the flask and then we need to calculate the concentration of those and from that we can figure out what the pH is. Now as homework, can I ask you guys to calculate what the pH of that solution would be if you've added, let's say, 45 milliliters. All right, we added 30 milliliters. Now I want you to try to calculate what would the pH of that solution turn out to be if you have 45 milliliters. All right? Now we're going to look at the next scenario which is at the equivalence point. Okay, so the next one would be, so we looked at after you had 30 milliliters, now let's look at pH at the equivalence point. All right, so we need to calculate what the equivalence point is. Remember, what is the equivalence point? We call this equivalence point or the stoichiometric point. And what does that represent? Can somebody tell me. What happens at the equivalence point? Equal amounts. Equal amount. In other words, the number of moles of the acid should equal the number of moles of the base. In other words, all of the acid has been completely neutralized by the base. And usually when you calculate the equivalence point, the underlying principle is that the number of moles, in this case the number of moles of acidic acid should equal the number of moles of hydroxide that you have in that solution. They have both reacted in a one-to-one -one stoichiometry because the balanced equation shows us that they react in a one-to-one -one ratio. So if all of the weak acid has been neutralized by the strong base, then you have to have the same number of moles of both. And we know that moles is what? Concentration times volume. So on this side, we have concentration of acidic acid times the volume of acetic acid and over here you have concentration of hydroxide which is sodium hydroxide times the volume of hydroxide which is the volume of sodium hydroxide that you added, okay? So at the equivalence point if I want to calculate the volume of hydroxide that's there, that would be the concentration of acetic acid times the volume of acetic acid divided by the concentration of hydroxide, which is we know concentration of acetic acid is 0.1 moles per liter times the volume was that we had 100 milliliters and we know that we had 0.1 moles per liter of base. So can you see that um, your volume of the base should be 0.1 milliliters. Now sometimes in the laboratory, you guys remember, sometimes in the lab they give you this equation M1V1 equals M2V2. This is the same thing. M is the molarity, volume is the volume of acid that you added and then M2V2 would be the molarity of the base times the volume of the base that you added. You have to be careful because you can only apply that if the acid and the base react in a one-to-one -one ratio, all right? So that you have one acidic proton all right? And therefore the hydroxide will react with that one acidic proton and therefore it's a one to one ratio. All right? So what do we know? Uh, wh how much base do I need to add at the equivalence point? You can see that I have to add 100 milliliters. All right? So if I add, when I've added 100 milliliters uh, base, I would be at the equivalence point. All right? So if I want to calculate pH, now I got to look at this. So pH 
at the equivalence point is, remember, the reaction we're looking at is the weak acid reacting with the base to give you the conjugate base plus liquid water, okay? And we said before reaction, we had 1 times 10 to the negative 2 moles. Remember in the flask when you have 100 milliliters of 0.1 molar, that's the number of moles of acidic acid that you had to start with. So that was 100 milliliters times 0.1 molar. Now we had at the equivalence point we have to have 100 milliliters. So can somebody tell me how many moles of hydroxide did I add? We had 100 milliliters, 0.1 molar and AOH. So what would be the number of moles of NaOH? What do you think? <coughs> Louder. It's the same thing. Do you understand that? Because at the equivalence point the number of moles have to be the same. Do you see the moles of acid have to be the same as the moles of base. So good. So you should see that, that you're at the equivalence point so you're going to have the same number of moles. So can everybody see? that this would be 10 to the negative 2 moles and we're going to have zero of this, all right? Now after reaction, so now the reaction is going to take place. This is the titration. You've added the base to the acid. They cannot coexist. They're going to react cleanly, rapidly and quantitatively. So the reaction is going to go to completion. So now can you see these are in the same amount? So if all of this reacts with all of that, you're going to end up with 1 times 10 to the negative 2 moles of the product. So remember we said at the equivalence point all the acid has been used up, all the base has been used up, so what are we left in solution at the end of the titration? The conjugate base. So now we need to calculate the pH of the conjugate base. How do you calculate the, BA, uh, the pH of a weak base? All right, so I need the concentration now. All right, so I'm going to take the number of moles and calculate the concentration and therefore that would be the concentration of the conjugate base which is 1 times 10 to the negative 2 moles divided by the volume. What is my volume? I had 100 milliliters in the flask. What's the volume of base that I added? 100. So what is my total volume? 200, okay? So I'm going to divide by the total volume which is 0 0.200 liters which gives me 0 0.0500 moles per liter. So now we go back to working, remember this is a conjugate base. How do I calculate the pH of, this is actually a salt, can you see that? It's the, it's the salt of the conjugate base of the weak acid, acidic acid. I know the initial concentration. So can everybody write down how you would calculate the pH of that solution? This is applying what we did like the, the first few weeks of class. What, so if you're going to calculate the pH of a weak base, what is the starting point? What do you need to write down? What do you start with? What do you need to write down? How do you calculate the pH of a weak base? All of you did really well on the test, so you need to know this. Ice chart. You have to draw the equilibrium and use the ice chart. You guys see that? So, so we're going to write down the equilibrium first. So this is acidic acetate anion, which is the salt of the conjugate base in water giving me the weak acid, what would I put here? OH minus, great. And this represents KB. Do they give me KB? No, they give me only KA. So I need to convert KA to KB. Therefore KB equals 1 times 10 to negative 14 divided by 1.76 times 10 to negative 5 which gives me the KB which is 5.68 times 10 to the negative 10th. 
You guys understand that I can move really fast because we've done many problems of this type. Remember once again, we're just applying what we've learned before. Okay? So if I want to write the ice chart, I start with my initial concentration would be 0 0.0500. I'm not concerned about water. I have 0, 0 to begin with. If I want to keep figure out what the change is, it would be negative x plus x plus x. Not concerned about water. At equilibrium, I know this will be 0 0.050 minus x, x, x. Okay? So we're looking at Kb because this is the formation of hydroxide from the weak conjugate base. Therefore Kb equals 5.68 times 10 to the negative 10 which is concentration of the acidic acid times the concentration of hydroxide divided by the concentration of the weak base. All right? So that gives me x squared over 0 0.0500 minus x, all right? And as all of you know, we can approximate this to x squared over 0 0.050. Now, since you guys know how to solve for this, I would like you to try this at home. You have to check the validity of your approximation. But if you calculate x after you check for validity of approximation and so on, x will come out to be um, 5.33 times 10 to the negative 6 molar. So we know that the hydroxide ion concentration equals X, which is 5.33 times 10, 10 to the negative 6 molar. Remember, we need to calculate pH, so I need to convert that to hydronium ion concentration, which is Kw <laughs> divided by the hydroxide ion concentration which is 1 times 10 to the negative 14 divided by um, 5.33 times 10 to the negative 6 molar. This will be molar squared. And therefore, if you work that out, it comes out to be 1.88 times 10 to the negative 9 molar. Therefore, pH equals 8.72. Seven. Remember, we said at the equivalence point, the pH has to be greater than 7 because that solution is basic, all right? And so we figured out what the pH of that solution is at the equivalence point, okay? Now, I need you to be able to calculate, so if you look at the fourth scenario, you need to be able to calculate pH after 100.05 milliliters of NaOH is added. Okay? Now, the solution to this is very similar to the strong acid because once we pass the equivalence point, now all of the acid has been consumed completely. So now all you have is a strong base, all right? And so the solution for this part will be exactly the same as the solution for the previous part. Because what you have is now, at the equivalence point, you have added 100 milliliters of the base. Now you have an excess of 0 0.05, all right? So in that solution, now you have a strong base and a weak base. And the strong base is much stronger than the weak base. Do you see that? So the major contribution is going to come from the strong base. So if you have 0 0.05 milliliters of excess hydroxide, all you have to do is calculate the number of moles in 0 0.05 milliliters of hydroxide, divide by the new total volume, which is 200.05, and that gives you the concentration of the strong base. And because a strong base dissociates completely, you know what the hydroxide ion concentration is, and so you know the hydroxide ion concentration that comes from that extra 0 0.05 that was not neutralized. All right? And you can calculate what the pH of that solution is. Okay? So you should be able to solve these kinds of problems. And in discussion for next week, actually it's this week, isn't it? The discussions actually get you to solve some of these problems. So I need you to be able to look at these different types of problems and to be able to solve them. Okay? Now, a couple of things I want to point out. So we're going to go back to this graph. And I want to point out some things on this graph. 
So if you look at this titration curve, this is the point at which there is no base added. So you should be able to calculate the pH of that weak acid. Okay? We know this region where it flattens out is called the buffer region. Okay? So in this region where it's flat, we call that the buffer region because that's the region where it's going to act as a buffer. So whenever you have mixtures of the weak acid and its conjugate base, it's going to act as a buffer. Okay? Now, this is the equivalence point. All right? And we know that the equivalence point, the pH will be greater than 7. Okay? Now, if you take, we, we already calculated that you have to add 100 milliliters to reach the equivalence point. So exactly half of that is called the half equivalence point, all right? And at the half equivalence point, what you realize is, so at the half equivalence point, what you realize is that the concentration of the acidic acid that's left over equals the concentration, sorry, CH3CO2 minus. Can I just rewrite that, okay? Because it's not very clear and I don't want to rush that. So at the half equivalence point, we know that the concentration of the acidic acid that's left over in the flask, the excess amount, should equal the concentration of the acetate ion. All right? So you know that pH equals pKa minus log of the acid over the base. And these two are equal to each other. What do we know? pH equals pKa minus log 1, which is pKa minus 0. So we know at the half equivalence point, pH should equal pKa. So if you're at the half equivalence point, so you figured out that the equivalence point is 100 milliliters. If you're at the half equivalence point, that's the perfect buffer. You have equal amounts of both, all right? And therefore, the pH should equal pKa. So if that's the case, you don't need to do any calculations. So if you get a question saying, you know, the point in the equivalence point, they ask you, what is the pH of the solution at this point? You don't have to do any math because you know pH equals pKa, and this is acidic acid. So pKa of acidic acid is what? 4.75. So you know that the pH at that point will be 4.75. Okay? Now I want to finish up by just quickly going through this question. So this is um, an old question. Uh, from an older exam, so I just pulled it this morning, and I want you guys to take a look at this. And I'll put a copy of this on the class website. Okay, so why is that? Here we are. So the question is, consider the titration of a generic weak acid with a strong base that gives the following titration curve. So you have already seen this curve. You know that it's a weak acid strong base curve, okay? On the curve, indicate the points that correspond to the following. The first is the equivalence point. So all of you know that the equivalence point of the stoichiometric point has to be this. Got it? So that's the equivalence point. The region with maximum buffering. So you want to show an arrow that kind of shows where this is plateaus out and flattens out. This is the region of maximum buffering. Somewhere between this and this, that region. Got it? pH equals pKa. Where would that be? You look at the equivalence point. It's a little above 25, all right? And it's 30 here, so it's somewhere between. So it's, it's actually somewhere here, right in the middle. So you have to look at this value and divide that exactly by half and that will give you where pH equals pKa and that will be that point there, okay? pH depends only on the initial concentration. So this should be a subscript, okay? 
And so if the pH depends on only the initial concentration of the weak acid, where would that be? Zero. Before you add any base, that would be the point at which, okay? pH depends only on the conjugate base at the equivalence point because the equivalence point is the only point at which you have exclusively just the conjugate base. Lastly, pH depends only on the amount of excess strong base added. Where, where would that be? Where does the pH depend on the amount of strong base? Anything past the equivalence point. So once you pass this, all of these points. Once you pass this, anything above that will depend on the concentration of the hydroxide, okay? So we'll stop there for today and next time we'll move on to the next topic.